Hey everybody, how you been? Teching 101 here. Wow, okay. Don't worry, the dark times are finally over, and the drought has finally lifted, the rain has come, and One Piece has returned. And thank Lord, Sun God, and Usopp for this, I gotta tell you, because I was starting to lose it. I was starting to lose my mind a little bit, but don't worry about old teching. I was able to hold it together, and today we are going to talk about the new chapter. Where is my camera that I should be talking to? I don't... Oh, there it is! Okay, hey everybody, how you doing? It's, it's been a while, don't worry, we're good, yeah. What number of chapter is this? This is chapter 1112. Wow, we're really getting high up there, right? How high is that number gonna go? I sure don't know. By the way, I have a different tie. Yeah, I went from a black tie to a red tie to a blue tie. What color tie am I going to wear next? I don't know. Maybe green. Maybe yellow. Maybe it'll be a ridiculous tie of, like, tiger print or something like that. I don't know, but we'll have to find out. Okay, so the cover page is on oh, the title of the chapter. Right, man, I am way discombobulated. I am way out of, of sorts today. All right. Let's get back to it, Matt. Come on. Come on. We do this. We do this a lot. But doing this for like, oh God, 15 years now getting close to it. All right. All right here we go. Whew. Okay. This will be One Piece chapter 1112 review titled Hard Aspect. Um, an aspect in this context, it's an astrological term uh, used in like horoscopes and things like that. You know, in the relation from like planets to one another and their alignments and everything. Um, obviously, this is a reference to the Garose being the five elder planets and there are certainly hard aspects. They are hard to deal with. But also, there's a line of dialogue at the end of the chapter that Marcus Mars says uh, talking about Vegapunk's luck and you know, you could look at a horoscope or a, a, like, a like a birth wheel and you could look at that to determine like, oh, how much luck are you going to have? Like, let me check my horoscope today. Taurus, how lucky am I going to be today? You know, something like that, right? So maybe it's referring to Vegapunk's luck at the end of the chapter. We'll get to that, though, okay? Uh, we continue on the cover page, the new cover series, chapter three of Yamato, Oni Child Yamato's Golden Harvest, or Golden Pilgrimage Around Wano, okay? So Yamato is going to truly follow in the footsteps of Odin and uh, travel around all of the different regions, you know, Curry and Kibi. I I hope Kibi, because Kibi we didn't really focus on all too much, Ringu, Ringo and Hakumai and everything. However, Yamato is still in the flower capital alongside Kinemon. Kinemon and the other scabbards are also, you know, there to be the bodyguards of Momonosuke. So Kinemon goes over to Yamato and is like, okay, Yamato, have fun on your journey. I'm sure you're going to have a bunch of wacky adventures. Um, <laughs> but uh, before you go, here's some money. And Yamato's like, ooh, money. <laughs> but also, hey, I have a favor to ask of you, okay? Okay? Don't spend it all in one place. Actually, I'd be interested in that because Kinemon has already done this with Odin before. They already went on this huge pilgrimage all over Wano way back in the day. And uh, maybe maybe Odin didn't have a lot of money to spend. And so, first of all, Kinemon's like, all right, I remember doing this pilgrimage back in the day. You're going to need this. But also, um, I have a favor to ask of you, please. So just do this one thing for me, please. Okay? And so we don't know what it is. We don't know what Kinemon is asking of Yamato. Uh, could have something to do with the curry region because that's where Kinemon on, you know, that's where uh, his wife uh, Osuru lives, not Osuru, who is the vice admiral of the Marines, but the other Osuru in the story. Um, could have something to do with maybe Otama's village. Otama's from the Amagasa village, the, uh, you know, the Straw Hat village, and that was wrecked and just ravaged, and pretty much the only people living there were Otama and uh, Tenguyama, who is now, um, we know, Sukiyaki. So Sukiyaki is, I don't know if Sukiyaki actually went to go live in the, in the capital, or if he went back to live in the village to maybe help rebuild it. So maybe that has something to do with that. Or it could just have something to do with another region of Wano that we're not really sure about. But um, yeah, so Kinemon asks this favor of Yamato and uh, he begins, it begins his journey. Okay, we continue where we left off. Does anybody remember? That's a legitimate question because I do not know. Wait a minute, I think something with the Iron Giant. But I don't think that's relevant because the Iron Giant does not show up in this chapter at all, okay? But we do have the Pacifistas. They're kind of like Iron Giants. I mean, they are giant relative to a human, and they are made of iron. Although, probably not made of iron. I, I imagine Vegapunk would come up with some other kind of better, like, steel at least, or some carbonized titanium. I, I, I don't know, metallurgy. But at any rate, we're seeing the outskirts of Egghead just being bombarded 
bombarded by the various battleships that are still left standing. They're just bombing the crap out of it, and they're like, we need to stop the Emperor Straw Hat and his crew! Surely a bunch of random marines from a battleship outside the island with cannon fire will be able to stop him the same way that we were able to do that with uh, Kaido and Big Mom. Oh wait, we weren't, but whatever. We have to try, man. We have to try. Load the cannons again! And they just got blowing the crap out of the island. Uh, the Pacifistas, uh, the Mark Threes, seem to be all defeated at this point. Ethan Baron V. Nusjuro, uh, in his skeletal centaur form, has just ran down pretty much all of them. Uh, some people have said, it was like, well, he's not technically destroying them, he's just freezing their circuits, so technically maybe if that ice were to melt, maybe they could power back on. I, I highly doubt that. I think, I given the fact of how direct the Gorobs they are here, especially when they all arrived, um, yeah, I don't think the Mark Threes are getting back up after this, especially after what they learned that Bonnie is the supreme commander of all pacifistas that bear Kuma's image. Yeah, I don't think Ethan is taking any, you know, uh, any half measures here. I think he is eliminating all of them because Ethan knows that, like, with a single word from Bonnie, that could change the entire battle all over again. Like, it's shifted multiple times here. Um, and uh, Ethan even says, like, hey, she's just a 12-year-old girl. To give her the ability to destroy entire nations at, at, with just a word, with just a sentence. Um, Vegapunk, you are truly the height of foolishness. You know, you deserve everything that's happening to you now. So the Garosei are like, no, we're going full steam ahead with this. We're eliminating the pacifistas. We're making sure that Bonnie cannot use their power against us in the future. And this is what has to happen. So he's riding down. He's just encircling Egghead. And we're going to see him later in the chapter arriving at the evac point and uh, uh, in a, a very uh, terrifying uh, panel, so we'll, we'll get to that though. Uh, we see Oimo and Kashi there, and Oimo and Kashi are like, they don't know exactly what's going on, they don't know the Garo Sayer here, and even if they did know the Garo Sayer here, and they have these monstrous forms, you know, how much would they really know about all that? But they're aware that like, haha, hey Oimo, it seems like something crazy's going on, some strong people have arrived. He's like, yeah, Kashi, we should probably get out of here. Oh yeah, 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 oh ho ho. You know, so they're, they're having a great time. I mean, remember, these are the war giants of Elbaf, you know, landing on an island and just attacking things, that's kind of their bread and butter, uh, and they have a big thing of butter and a big knife to spread that butter, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I think they're also aware that like, hey, this is uh, this is an evacuation mission, we need to get out of here, and also we sent some really gnarly hockey over there, we should probably steer clear of that, okay, Kashi, let's do that, alright, let's just go, alright. Um, we cut over to the evacuation point, Ethan is not there yet, but we do see Frankie fighting against Vice Admiral Red King. This was the battle, this was Frankie's moment in Egghead we were all waiting for. It actually is a really cool moment. Um, so Red King is based off of that kaiju from uh, Ultraman. Uh, he has like the multiple chins, but he also has like that mechanical arm that kind of looks like Zephyr's arm from Film Z, except Red King's is not as cool. And it's clearly made of some uh, shoddy stuff, uh, because he takes it up like steam knuckle and then Frankie's like oh you want to have a battle with a cyborg arm or you want to arm wrestle with Frankie oh you're gonna regret this strong right and it just breaks right through uh, Red King's mechanical arm just shreds it into pieces it just explodes okay Frankie has the strongest right arm this side of the north blue I'll tell you what okay so it not only breaks right through Red King's like steam knuckle arm but also punches him square in the face and you see as a giant neck so you see like a vein pop out on his neck like Argh! and you know he just falls to the ground so Frankie just one shot a vice admiral all right now look 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 I know we're dealing with Gear 5th Luffy's and Yonko and Shanks's and, and, and Admirals zipping around in their light forms and, and the Garosei are there now. I, I get all that. We've, we've power crept One Piece a little bit in the last arc or so, right? But I still want to reiterate the fact Frankie de defeated a Vice Admiral of the Marines, and, and he wasn't one of the weaker ones either. I mean, Red King was one of the Vice Admirals to lead a buster call at Egghead. This was an important mission. They're not just going to get anybody for this, okay? They picked him specifically for this mission, like, you're the guy, Red King, you're the dude. And Frankie just, strong, right, boom, and just knocks him flat out, all right? That's pretty impressive from Frankie, man. So, um... 
Kuma is handed over to one of the giants, uh, one of the bigger ones, that uh, one of the bigger giants that's kind of an oxymoron, but, you know, the giant that has a big beard. He has a big flowing beard and, like, a mullet. And he's like, hey, watch my father for me. You know, Bonnie says, you know, like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll protect Kuma with my life. It's like, great. So Bonnie is now jumping into the fray there. So we have the next Vice Admiral coming up to bat. There were three that were there. There was Guillotine, there was Red King, and now there's Palmsky. Palmsky is the dude with the chin. He kind of resembles Frankie in that department a little bit, but he also has like some kind of otter zone that allows him to turn into a sea otter, and he has this like club staff thing with a seashell at the end of it, and he can like smash things with it, so it's a very devastating zone. At any rate, um, Pomsky is just like, Bonnie, we're going to defeat you so we can get back our war machines. They're our property. And so Bonnie jumps into the fray, and she's like, do not speak of my father like he's your property. He was a good man. He was a hero. He's not for you to control. And so she activates her Toshi Toshi no Mi and like slaps Pomsky in the face, turning him into a child. So he's mini Pomsky. He's just like, I am Pomsky. Oh, I am Pomsky. Oh no. And then Bonnie just kicks him right in the face. Just going South Park style with it. Kick the baby right in the face. And Guillotine is in the back. He's the only Vice Admiral left now, I guess. And he's just like, oh, this is terrible. What are you doing? Please don't kick children. <laughs> and, and Bonnie is just like, oh, no, no, no. This is schoolyard rules now. Just bam. <laughs> okay, so smacks Bombski upside the face. All right, so that nothing else displays how strong Frankie is, which we already knew. I mean, Frankie's a straw hat. We spend more time with him. But um, also just how powerful Bonnie power is like in film uh, I'm not film uh, stampede when she was fighting against bullet uh, she did attempt to use her Toshi Toshi powers to turn bullet into a child now that probably wouldn't have worked for bullet because he was like the main villain of that movie and he was basically like a diet version of Kaido but in theory yeah if, if I guess their hockey isn't strong enough or whatever and even if their hockey is good enough remember like when law was affected by Doc Q's sickness power right and he was turned into a woman uh, it's still happened and he was able to reverse the effects with some effort but he had to like put some hockey into it to reverse those effects if Bonnie uses her power really quick enough like boop turned you into a baby oh no I can't fight no you can't boom it just kicks him upside the face I mean before he even realizes what's going on I imagine being turned into a baby would kind of disorient you a little bit like what just happened and just bam it's like okay so um yeah in that in that respect your power is pretty strong unless you realize it right away or you're so powerful that you can just you know re your regular hockey that's just out is enough to like prevent that attack so I don't think it would work on Big Mom or Kaido or anything like that uh, but anybody else, like, it hits by that, just like, wait, what's going on? And that, that gives you an opening, right? Okay. So, we now cut back to the Labo phase. Uh, York has been freed by uh, Marcus Mars, and uh, he is still in his giant, like, uh, Itsumade form, the yokai bird, and York is now equipped with a bazooka, uh, so I guess they are working together here. I mean, to the point where Marcus Mars is at least like, okay, York, you are a Vegapunk, you would know where this broadcast is coming from, I need you to show me, okay? So York picks up a bazooka and is just like, alright, I'll show you, I, I know at least where it was filmed. So, she very clearly doesn't know like the memories of everything that's happening here. She doesn't know the Stella's plan to like how they're going to uh, relay this message because otherwise she would just be like, I know that there is a transponder Den Den Mushi, there's a, uh, a live streaming Den Den Mushi up in Punk Records and it's right there. Like, she doesn't know that, okay? So she's like, all right, well, let's go to the monitor room. So they go to the monitor room. This was the location where it was filmed. Uh, and she kind of trails off, like, yeah, I know for... Okay, so this is clearly where it was filmed. And before she could even finish, Mars is just like, Bruh! Like, fire in my laser and just blast a laser beam that just destroys the entire room. Just obliterates everything in the room. Shoots a laser, clear out the other side of the lab. And York is just like, oh, hey, whoa, cool down, man. Be careful. There's important stuff in here, right? And it didn't even work because the broadcast is still going. They obliterated the monitor room, uh, but you still have the broadcast going on. Vegapunk is there like it's like it's only like a couple minutes left like four minutes left until the uh, the message is relayed and Vegapunk is just like oh oh this uh this uh, coffee is way too hot Quasar perhaps if we imply the coolant ability maybe then we could cool down the coffee so I can drink it and uh, Vegapunk also mentions he, he has a very sensitive tongue like a cat so yeah it's just that that's a little funny thing it, it's it's really hilarious because 
Mars has to eliminate this broadcast somehow, and he destroys an entire room like that did it, and then you just still hear Vegapunk like from beyond the grave mocking him like, no, this coffee is so hot, Quasar. He's like, damn it, it didn't stop it. It's like, and so it's like, York, where is the broadcast? And York is like, hey, hey, hey I don't know, okay? Look, um, you just can't be blowing up the entire lab because that's what Mars says next. He's like, all right, you know what? Screw this. I'm a giant yokai bird. I'm just going to blow up the entire lab. And she's like, not a good idea for a bunch of different reasons, okay? Number one, the power plant is on the first floor of this place so you don't want to blow that up because then the mother frame will go bye-bye or the mother flame mother flame will go bye-bye it's mother flame um, and also on another floor is a weapon manufacturing floor you guys want that right and also on the third floor there are a bunch of high-pressure gas cylinders so if you were to explode all of those at once it wouldn't just be the lab building you're blowing up it would be the entire labo phase including punk records that's all gone all right so, and also, in that case, if Punk Records is destroyed, I mean, we see that the satellites are, like, autonomous of themselves. Like, just because the Stella died, they don't seem to die, and it doesn't even seem like York is aware that the Stella is dead right now, okay? Or something happened to the Stella where they might die, you know? I'm pretty sure the main body is dead, but it's One Piece, you never know. Um... So, it seems like they're all independent, but the destruction of Punk Records, though, which is the brain center, which is, you know, the brain brain fruit that Vegapunk consumed, that is destroyed. Maybe that might do something to the satellites. I'm not really sure, but if anything did, it would be the destruction of that. So they got to make sure not to destroy that, right? Um, so, um, Marcus is like, well, you're one of the Vegapunks. You think the same as the Stella. You tell me how to fix this. And so you can see Marcus is even kind of panicking a little bit here because it's like I blew up, you know, you know, he's he's not dumb, but also at the same time, he's not on the intelligence level of Vegapunk. So it's like, all right, we blew up the monitor room and the broadcast is still going. So you tell me what to do here, York. Right. And York is like, right. OK, I, I, I know what to do. I am a Vegapunk. Of course, I know what to do. I could stop this. I don't want to rack up any more sins. She uses sins in the sense of like, you know, against the Gorosei who view themselves as gods, the Tenerobito view themselves as gods in general, so dishonoring them or going against their will is going to rack up your sin points, you know, and so York is just like, hey, it'll be harder to even hang out with everybody. It'll be harder to really work with you guys. And um, Marcus doesn't really respond to that because Marcus senses with his observation hockey, no doubt, there is a voice coming up from Punk Records, like in Punk Records itself like in the hangar right so he looks up he's like i sense a small voice that must be where the message is being relayed and york is like yeah it's the new uh, live streaming den den mushies that we developed they're kind of shaped like a triangle hey have you seen film red they show up in film red marcus if you've seen that i was in film red i know about film red Uta's not canon. Well, she kind of is. No! <laughs> and so he's like, how do I gain access to the to the uh, the hangar of punk records? Good question, because we just see it as like a giant grid, like a glass ceiling. Like, we don't really know, like, how do you get up there, right? So uh, York apparently tells him. We don't hear the instructions, but York does explain to Marcus Mars how he gets in there, because I don't think he just blasts his way in with his laser breath. I think he does get in the, the proper way. So he begins to fly up to punk records there. So, uh, yeah, the, the idea was with York being like, yeah, I, I'm going to fix this because if I don't fix this, I won't be able to work alongside you guys. Uh, York, yeah. I mean, I mean, look, at this point, if the Stella is dead and some of the other Vegapunks are dead and uh, we have like Edison and Lilith that are obviously on the side of the Straw Hats, uh, York is the only remnant of Vegapunk remaining that would actually work alongside the Garose. So they might not kill her just from the fact of like, all right, the Straw Hats have Edison, Atlas, and Lilith. We need a Vegapunk too because we need to balance the scales a little bit here, all right? Uh, either eliminate all of them. That would probably be their ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is probably to eliminate every single one of the satellites so they just don't have to worry about this shit anymore. But until that happens, they're going to probably keep York alive because she will work with them. Even right now, she admitted, like... I still want to work with you guys because I guess her goal is to still be a Tenrubito, so she wants to live the high life, I guess, right? 
It's not going to happen, but she's still allied with them. Okay, so we cut back to the command room where Marcus and York were just at. So, you know, I guess Marcus freed York. I don't know how he did that because he was a giant bird. Did he just like, okay, hold on a second, York. I'll just reach down with my giant yokai bird talons and just rip off your chains or whatever. Uh, I'll use my beak to like <laughs> rip off the chains. Uh, so they got away though, but Stussy and Kaku are still in the command room. Kaku is still bubbled and Stussy is there um, talking to him. Kaku has no idea, by the way. Well, he assumes that was one of the five elders, but it wasn't apparent. He was like, okay, I think that monster just left. I guess they didn't want anything to do with us. So that's Fine, I guess. Also, might have Marcus might have actually carried out the uh, the desire of Lucci, because Lucci, when Marcus was leaving, was just like, "Hey, make sure to not kill Kaku. Make sure he survives." And Marcus is like, "Can't promise anything. After all, you're all just insects to me." So Marcus arrives in the command room, frees York. Probably did notice Stussy and Kaku there, but was like, "Whatever. I don't care." It, it was probably not out of any allegiance or care for Rob Lucci. It was probably more about just like. All I need is York. York can tell me where it is. These two other people are irrelevant to me. Stussy was a CP0 member that defected. Ah, whoever gives a shit, I don't care. Kaku's in a bubble, whatever. I'm getting out of here, right? So Kaku doesn't immediately know it was a Garose, but he suspects. He was like, I imagine that is one of the five elders. There are truly monsters. Because um, it was a question like, how did Lucci know that that bird was Marcus? A lot of people said, well, maybe the voice. I imagine the voice would be distorted a little bit when you go into a giant Itsumade yokai form. Um, but also it's the idea that like if you're working in cypher pole zero especially and you're dealing with the garo say like taking orders from them and shit like that I imagine after a while you would begin to suspect things like also the fact that they don't age like ever I'm sure there's some rumors going around in Marijois like the Garosei are immortal, or the Garosei are like actual gods. Like a lot of the Tenerobito just say that, but like they're the ones that actually can back it up, right? So Kaku and Stussy are not like super surprised by this. Kaku is just like, what in the world was that monster? And Stussy's like, it was probably one of the five elders, I assume. And then Kaku's like, yeah, just as I thought. What a horrifying transformation. So they like, they kinda knew, or at least they suspected, right? Now at this point though, Stussy is left behind with Kaku. Kaku can't leave because he's bubbled, but Stussy is free. And she's like working at the command station, like pushing buttons. And then Kaku is like, hey, so they left you behind, huh? That new, uh, that new group that you defected us for. You betrayed us to run off to them. And they're, I guess, leaving you to die. And Stussy's like, no, I chose to. I, I need to be the one to stay behind because somebody needs to lower the... Uh, somebody needs to be the Bon Clay in this arc, okay? And Bon Clay isn't here anymore. He suffered enough, so I have to be the one to make sure that the barrier goes down and then they can escape. Because, you know, that was a bit of an issue. Like, how are they going to lower the Frontier Dome? It has to be done from the command room. We find that out in this chapter. So she's like, I decided to stay of my own accord and this is my responsibility, and this is my final mission, okay? So, uh, Kaku's there, he's like, well, I guess I would care more about this if uh, you didn't already betray us. So, you know, so they're having a little bit of a back and forth there. I, I really hope Stussy and Kaku both make it out of this alive, because I think there's more stuff from Stussy's character definitely we could focus on here. And Kaku, I just like. I, I think Kaku, I, there's really nothing in his dialogue that's directly saying that, like, I'm done with the government. But I think after all of this, I think it's pretty apparent that he's, like, not going to go back working for him. I, I, I really think, like, Lucci maybe, but Kaku, I feel, is like, yeah, I'm done with this. <laughs> I'm done with this whole shit, right? All right. So we cut back over to Nami's group. We have Chopper, we have Edison, we have Robin, we have Lilith and Brooke and everybody. And uh, we have Edison actually explaining the situation of why Stussy stayed behind to Nami. And obviously Nami, everybody's upset about this. It's like, wait, wait, Stussy's going to stay behind? She's going to die. And it's like, yeah, but it can't be helped. You know, the Frontier Dome can only be lowered from the uh, command room. So somebody had to stay behind to do it. Um, and Stussy offered. So she has to do it. It's, it's the only way to do it. And uh, Nami's like, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, we have to escape. We have to make sure we get out of here but still this is kind of you know like I, I don't want her to leave behind and die um robin is even still like like questioning like how are we even going to get out of here like even if the dome is lowered and we have the sunny yeah we have coup de burst 
but we're not going to be able to fly far enough unless we had Vega Force 1, and that's been destroyed. So, uh, the Coup de Burst can fly the Sunny a kilometer away, but, like, if the Labo phase is up here, you know, Egghead is a big island, you might not, like, this might be the perimeter of the island, Coup de Burst might just, like, you know, might just do this or whatever, might not get you far enough away. Or even if it does make you to get to the ocean, it'll be right outside Egghead. It won't fly you away to the point where it's like, oh, the battleships won't be in range anymore, right? We need to get the hell out of here. So that was the whole idea originally was to do a combination of Vega Force 1, get you out of the airspace, and then take a coup de burst from there. Usopp comes out and he's like, hey, preparations for the coup de burst are done. I'm ready to go. As soon as Zoro's and the others will be able to get out of here. Uh, Zoro and Jinbei, by the way, we don't know what's going on with them in this chapter. We do not see them at all. But Edison has a plan. Don't worry, guys. The little robot buddy has a plan. And he's just like, ah, scientists preserve things like miracles. That's what I do. Do not worry, everybody. I will figure out a way to save us all. And so he flies out of the Frontier Dome and gets nuked by the lasers. Edison, no! <laughs> it's not you! Anybody but you, please! No, it could have been Atlas, not you! <laughs> I just say, no, he's not dead. He's not dead. Because, it's actually kind of a clever thing, because Vegapunks were the ones that designed the Frontier Dome, they know exactly how much energy at 100% is going to pump into those lasers, right? And Edison is able to calculate all that because he's a Vegapunk, he's also a little robot guy. So he's like, okay, I've calculated the damage that the lasers are going to deal to me, it'll be at 78%. I should still be okay. You know, like 78% of me is going to get damaged, but that's not 100%. I should still be able to maintain function and do what I need to do, okay? So he jumps through the barrier and pfft, Edison! And we don't see what else happens to him after this, but he continues onward, okay? But don't worry, trust in the Vegapunks. He's got this. Uh, he's kind of metagaming this a little bit. Like, all right, if I move over there... That person is going to get an opportunity attack. They're going to be able to hit me, but there is no way with their weapon and their bonuses that they are going to be able to kill me, so I'll take that opportunity attack to set up something else. You know what I mean? He's metagaming it, but he's a Vegapunk. It would make sense. It would actually be a pretty cool ability for humans to have. You know, like, hey, there's a burning building over there with a kitty cat that's on the second floor. All right, I know that fire does this much damage, and if I run into that building, I will probably take... Eh, 62% damage? Yeah, I won't die. <laughs> and, and then you can run in and stay, save the cat. You're like, I have saved the cat! So we cut over to the battlefield now. We get a bunch of stuff going on here. A lot of crap happening in these next two page spread things. Uh, we have Luffy, Dory, and Broggy against... Top Man and Peter and, uh, well, Saturn's actually left. We actually see Saturn a little later. So right now it's just the giant sandworm and the boar guy, okay? And so in speaking of the sandworm, he is just inhaling everything. He is just do he's using the suck power, all right? My God, does Peter suck, all right? He's just like, oh, and he just opens up his big gullet and starts making a vortex to suck everything in. Buildings, trees, the flames, rocks, everything is getting sucked sucked into that. Even Dory and Broggy that are massive giants are like trying to run away and they're like, oh, we're being sucked in, Broggy. Oh, yes, Dory. It's just like that time back on Elbaf. No time for reminiscing. <laughs> okay. And then you have Luffy who's still in gear fifth that's trying to resist as well. And he looks over and he sees a building and he's like, all right, if you're so hungry, why don't you chow down on this building? And he, like, knocks it out of the ground, picks it up, and, like, chucks this huge building. It's kind of like in the shape of a, uh, like, a rook uh, playing chess, you know, like a little rook piece. Throws that right into Peter's gullet. And you actually see the indent of the castle, like, hit the back of his throat. And it just kind of, like, it's like his whole body's made of, like, uh, latex or something, or rubber, as it were. But the building hitting the worm just makes the indent on the other side, like... And so Peter, I guess, starts to choke on this um, mighty girth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just rolling with it. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. The innuendos, why not? Just keep going with it, all right? So, um... He can't take all of this quite enough, so it, the vortex does stop there. However, it came as a price, because Luffy has now finally disengaged Gear 5th. Look, he fought Kizaru in Gear 5th, and then he disengaged, he was like all shriveled up, and then I guess it might have been Van Auger that teleported him over to the vending machines to get some food to distract everybody, so Auger and Katarina could do their whole thing with uh, Saturn, right? However, 
you know, Gear 5 doesn't last forever, and I like the fact that Oda is like, yeah, it isn't just like he ate some food and now he's good for the rest of the arc. He's been doing a lot of crazy attacks, like the baseball shit and everything like that. He's been doing a lot of wacky stuff in Gear 5. It's gonna disengage again, all right? This, he burns through fuel really fast while he's in that form. So he gets all shriveled up again, and he's like, uh, I have used up all my power, so hungry, need food. And uh, Broggy's there, and he's just like, oh, you need food? Well, have some of our uh, El Baf emergency rations. It's called Hakarl. Hakarl? Oh, whatever. Just, just eat it. <laughs> just shoves it into Luffy's mouth, and uh, okay. This stuff is a real thing that actually exists, all right? It is a delicacy of Iceland called fermented shark. I became aware of this because, a little bit of a flashback, when I was in high school, I had a teacher that had a class called Travel the Globe with Geography. And it was an elective course that you didn't have to take it, but it was an elective course that was in the final year of my senior year. And I love geography, so I'm like, I'll take this course. And all the class was, mainly, was we just watched episodes of Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, he's unfortunately passed away since then. Yeah, he took his own life a few years ago. Uh, very tragic. I was actually very upset when he died because he was a great chef and he was like for Travel Channel stuff. He was really cool. And uh, my teacher, by the way, would have been devastated because he loved Anthony Bourdain. Uh, so R.I.P. Anthony Bourdain. However, one of the episodes of No Reservations, it was a travel show where he just went over all over the world and he had different foods and delicacies. He went to Iceland to try some of this, uh, not, not just specifically to try this, but just to try foods. And he had some of that fermented shark. And he called it the most horrible thing he's ever eaten in his entire life, okay? Apparently this stuff, this fermented shark stuff, uh, it just reeks of ammonia. Like, it reeks of, like, cleaner. Like, open, like, a random cleaner under your sink and just, oh, yeah, that's what this shit smells like, okay? But apparently it is an acquired taste. A lot of people in Iceland do enjoy it, and it doesn't taste as bad as it smells, but I would imagine it is like kind of like eating something that your body is telling you like this is not food, this is not edible, this will kill you, right? So a lot of times when first first timers eat this food, they have to like plug their nose and just like, oh god. So uh, if I ever do go to Iceland, I'm probably never going to try this, but it is a reference. So he just, sh Broggy just shoves it in Luffy's mouth and just like, oh god, what is this? It stinks, what is this shit? And then all of a sudden Luffy just bulks up, he just like, oh, okay. I'm not really sure what that was. It, it stank, but I got power. Carl. <laughs> so Luffy's not in Gear Fifth again. He just goes. He just gets really muscly. He loses the uh, the shriveled up nature of himself, but he's still in his regular form, right? Now, also keep in mind, this is the kind of food that giants eat when they re want to revitalize themselves. So Luffy eating it is just like turbocharged, kind of like, Ugh! okay? So uh, I don't know how much more of that shit they have, right? So he just, Broggy's just like, here, have this fermented shark, okay? So Luffy's not going back into Gear 5th again. Instead, he decides to go with an old favorite, Gear 3rd Hockey Red Rock. The same attack he used in Chapter 1000 against Kaido, right? Remember that? He just, you know, armament hockey and just, you know, boom, try to use the Ryuo technique and added that to the Red Rock. He punches a top man in his boar form right on the top of his head with Red Rock. A move that actually did manage to, like, daze Kaido a little bit. Like, it, it had an effect when Luffy used it on him, right? It didn't drop Kaido or anything, but it had an effect. He hits top man with this. Top man is completely uninjured. And the vibrations come up Luffy's arm, and he's just like, yeah, that hurts! And he holds up his hand. It's kind of like what happened when he fought uh, Katakuri. When Luffy went into armament, and Katakuri went into armament, and they clashed, and Luffy's hand was like all swollen, and like, oh, it hurts, it hurts, hurts! Even going into hockey, having armament hockey wasn't good enough. And it looks even worse here, like, Luffy's hand is still on fire from the Red Rock, and it's just like, oh, God, it's throbbing, it hurts! Right? So he's like, what are you made of? Okay, so... Something to keep in mind with the Garo Say here. Some people have said that like, oh, this is kind of wacky or goofy. The Garo Say are kind of jokes because Luffy's being able to do all this crazy stuff in Gear 5. He's able to like, you know, knock back their poison bombs and blow up and everything like that. And this is all silly and, and it's like they're not taken seriously. I want to clarify a couple of things here. Number one, even in Luffy's Gear 5, which by the way, I will remind you, is Luffy's strongest form he has. He has not seriously injured any of the Gorosei yet. They are able to heal almost immediately. And even Luffy mentioned, even when he knocked back the thing with the baseball bat and they all blew up, they're still coming, they're still regenerating. Doesn't look like they're really all that injured at all from that, okay? And so now, 
Luffy's not in Gear 5 anymore. Luffy's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't keep going into Gear 5 because I only have a certain amount of time I can do that. I'm going to use Gear 3rd Red Rock. That's got to at least do something. Nope. Doesn't do shit. Luffy uses Armament Hockey, the Ryuo, all the techniques he learned while he was in Wano, fires up Red Rock, punches him square on the head, and it does nothing to Top Man and actually injures Luffy instead, all right? Yeah, Dory and Broggy were able to, like, slice off uh, Peter and, you know, have him, like, you know, just, like, reform and stuff like that, so you can't injure them. Uh, you can injure them in the sense that they need to regenerate, but even after that, it doesn't seem like they're really on the, like, oh, I've been wounded, I might die soon. Like, none of the Garose have gotten to that point yet, okay? So, we just see a close-up of Top Man, like, mmm. So, I think it's once again trying to clarify this. There's no way they're beating the Garosei in this arc. Like, that's not what the point of this is. They're not jokes. It's just Luffy's ability while in Gear 50. He's the strongest he can be right now. And he's using all these wacky moves. And yeah, it, like, the Garosei might not be able to dodge them or might not be able to respond the proper way because Luffy has Toon Force and everything like that. Um, but the attacks aren't really damaging them. And at the end of the day, when Luffy tries anything else, like, I'm sure if Luffy tried Gear 4th or Snake Man or, or Gear... We haven't seen Gear 2nd in forever. Remember Gear 2nd? That was a fun time. Yeah, we haven't seen Luffy use that shit in forever. But, like, even if Luffy did anything else except for Gear 5th, um, it's probably just gonna, like, ow, it's just gonna hurt him more it's gonna hurt them, okay? Especially if it's, like, a regular punch or something, right? Because Red Rock was able to kind of, like, daze Kaido, like, whoa, okay, I actually felt that, all right? Uh, Top Man didn't feel that, all right? So... Last couple of scenes of the chapter, we're kind of scattering all over Egghead to see where all the different Garosei are. So Top Man and Peter are fighting Luffy, Dory, and Broggy. So we cut to the Labo phase where we see Usopp, Nami, and Chopper looking over the edge of the cloud, and we see some spider legs arriving over the cloud. <laughs> uh, me and a friend just uh, saw this movie last week. It was called Sting. It was about an alien spider, so that kind of reminds me of that. Anyway, giant, like, da -da 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 -da, giant spider arrives. It's okay, though. It's okay, guys. Usopp's there. Usopp's there, and he's got his slingshot primed. The second Saturn sticks his ugly head over that cloud, he's getting a face full of flowers from Usopp. And it's gonna be game over, I'll tell you what. Then we cut over to the shore, the evacuation point. One of the giants, actually the giant that was holding Kuma, he's not holding Kuma here, so maybe he dropped him or put him on the ship, but the giant with the beard and the mullet gets sliced, and he goes down, and then we have... Uh, Venus Juro arriving, Ethan, in silhouette, and he looks haunting in this panel. He arrives, blood on his sword, centaur legs, just the silhouette of his body and like the ribbon of his mythical zone, if it is a mythical zone, just ooh, and then just the outline of his glasses, doing that anime glasses thing, just like the glasses light up and that's it, right? Uh, the giant falls. Atlas and Bonnie. Bonnie has a stick. <laughs> Facing off against one of the Garosei with a stick. Okay. And then Frankie's there. And they're just taking battle phases like, what is this? What is this? What are we fighting now? Okay. Now Sanji's also on his way. So I think Sanji's going to arrive here at some point and fight against him. Not to say that's going to make sure they're going to win, but having more people to fight is definitely helpful. Um, okay, and then, last, last scene of the chapter, we see what Mars is up to. Mars has arrived inside Punk Records, so we're actually inside of the hangar. It's all dark in here, so we don't really know what it exactly looks like, and that's on purpose, because what we're gonna see in a second here. So, uh, we hear the message still broadcasting, like, there's only a minute left of the message, Quasar, I will have my coffee. And then we have Marcus. He's now back in his human form. He's not in the bird form. He's not in his hybrid. He's in his human form. Well, not human form, but he's in his, his regular form. He has his coat on and everything like that. He's like leisurely walking through punk records. And we see the live streaming Den Den Mushi, the distribution Den Den Mushi, the one that we did see in film red. Like this is, it's the same one, okay? So it's canon. And then um, he's approaching and he's like, ah, uh, your luck is running out today, Vegapunk. It seems like you don't have very good luck after all, Vegapunk. So maybe that's a reference to the aspect, the horoscope, and everything like that. Well, anyway, as Mars is casually walking over to this Den Den Mushi, you hear a sound. You hear like a like a bloop, bloop, glorp, 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 glorp bubbles. I think I think the onomatopoeia for it is like bubbly, like you know, like that, right? Whatever it is, okay. And Mars is just walking, and he hears that, like, and he's like, hmm. And he looks up, and that's the end of the chapter. No break next week. I think there's a chapter next week, and then we're going on break again, okay? But 
I'm thinking <laughs> that's Vegapunk's brain, all right? Because you're hearing the bl 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 and you think of a brain in a jar, and it's got like the the bubbles going and everything like that, like bl 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 brain in a jar kind of thing, right? Uh, yeah. So I I've seen a lot of brains in jars doing this job before. Well, actually, only one other time, but it was in Bleach. It was against this guy. Kempachi was fighting this kid that can imagine things. Long story. That was actually ten years ago already. Ten years ago, 2014 was when the Grammy fight with Kenpachi was. Crazy. And now we have another brain in a jar, probably. Could be a brain in a jar, and it's probably a huge brain, too, because we know how big Vegapunk's brain got, right? So, the question is, let's say it is a brain in a jar, alright? Let's say it is Vegapunk's brain in a jar, and it's bubbling up there, right? What is that going to do to Marcus, right? Does... Vegapunk's brain in a jar have some ability to like, you know, I will banish you and just like, what? I don't know! You know, I will paralyze you with my brain powers, my psionic powers, you know, or something like that. Or, I think the smarter thing would be, if I was Vegapunk, I wouldn't set up just one of these Den Den Mushi. Uh, I wouldn't even set them up on the island. If these live streaming Den Den Mushies are like, you know, like routers or whatever, like you could just put them up wherever and they can receive the signal and broadcast all over the world, I would put these things on Egghead for sure, as decoys, but I would also put them around Egghead, like go to a bunch of random islands around here, or not even islands, but maybe just like rocks in the middle of the ocean, just leave like deserted islands, just leave these snails there, and they're broadcasting the, symbol, uh, the um, message all over the world through that system, right? So, even if, even if Marcus just walked over and just stepped on this Den Den Mushi, I don't think the broadcast is going to end. I don't think that Vegapunk only... This is a very important message that the world needs to know in case I die. I'm going to set one Den Den Mushi in Punk Records, and if that one is destroyed, it's gone forever. I doubt that, okay? So, even if he destroys it, not a big deal. I mean, it would be a big deal to this snail, because the snail would be dead, and that would suck. But, um, yeah, I, I think... Marcus is going to look up and he's going to see a giant brain in a vat connected to a bunch of wires. It's going to look like the inside of, a, of, of somebody's head, like the brain, kind of like, you know, the, the synapses and all the different, like, wiring in your brain and everything like that. It's going to be kind of what Punk Records is. It's very dark that we're seeing it right now. So maybe, like, the lights will come up and it'll be like, huh? You know, and then maybe Vegapunk's brain will be able to speak to him, you know, communicate or something. It's like, hello, Mars. I knew you were going to come, Quasar. <laughs> you know, like, and Marcus is just like, ah, Vegapunk, you turned yourself into a giant brain. How grotesque. Um, says the giant bird. Yeah, 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 whatever. Anyway, I'm ending this broadcast. Oh, did you think that was the only one? <laughs> you know, and it might be a thing like that. I don't know. But then again, if it is Vegapunk's brain, couldn't Marcus just turn into the bird and just laser beam him and just destroy the brain? Maybe there's a way to avoid that. I don't know. Uh, also, it might not be the brain. It might be something else. Maybe he just saw bubbles. Maybe there's just bubbles inside of the dome for some reason. Um, something else that might be bubbly... I'm thinking cloning, you know, because we even saw the tanks with the Seraphim tanks. They were like that green fluid and the bubbles and everything like that, the green blood. So it's like maybe it's a clone of somebody. Maybe it's a clone of Joy Boy. Maybe it's a clone of the Garosei. Maybe it's a bunch of Vegapunk clones in case he did die. It's Operation Phoenix from Rick and Morty. Who knows, right? We just know it's making some kind of sound effects. So... Have fun with that. I mean, I will have fun with that for the next week, trying to theorize what that is. You know what I mean? Like, when Luffy first started going gear fifth at the end of the chapter, and, you know, he's there, and his body is changing, it's like, oh, it has something to do with the resin or something. This is just a sound effect. Oda's literally just given us a sound effect to go on here, all right? So, like, all right, I'll do my best, I suppose. All right, well, that's the end of the chapter, and, um... It's good to be back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy, and uh, we'll get to some uh, videos and uh, follow-up and everything that's happening here. What was your favorite part of the chapter? Um, I gotta say, it, it's still looking like the Gorosei kind of have the upper hand here, definitely. Uh, especially when Luffy tried punching one not in Gear 5 and the damage that he incurred, right? So uh, that's, that's not great. Um, Usopp's gonna deal with Saturn. That's not a big deal. Uh, Ethan dealing with Atlas and Bonnie and Frankie, that's a problem. Even if Sanji shows up, that's going to be a bit of an issue. We don't know where Zoro and uh, Jean Bay are at right now. I guess they're heading to the ship. Edison's going to make it through. Edison's going to survive. Just don't worry, guys. Edison will make it, all right? I know we only care about Edison. He'll survive. I know he will, okay? All right. Wait, wait. That was the chapter review. 
figure out what the bubbles are coming from or what the bubbles are all about. All right, later, everybody. Signing out.